<clears throat> let's just roll on in. Um, thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight. And again, officially on the recording, I want to get my apologies in for uh, <laughs> my technical issues. Um, <clears throat> so um, we'll call a meeting to order, 706. Um, are there um, any adjustments to the agenda that anyone has tonight? Yes, I do, Mary Margaret. Um, I was actually hoping that um, we could just move two small things to the top of the meeting, which are just very quickly, uh, Frank and I have a website update and then um, separately, um, Susan uh, Silverberg and I did a character survey and I just like to get those two things since they're really quick. Um, I know it doesn't follow Rosenberg's rules of orders, but I just thought we can get them out of the way before we get to the meat of the discussion, because um, that's usually um, where we spend a lot of time later in the meeting. Um, yep. So if that's okay with everybody. That's fine with me. Um, any objections? Okay. All right. We'll do that. Um, let's approve the minutes first, and then we'll... Um, and then we'll roll into the website update and the character survey and um, then uh, talk with our guests. Um, so the minutes have been distributed. <clears throat> um, before we get into discussion, does anyone have a, uh, want to make a motion to approve them? I make a motion to approve the minutes. OK, any discussion? I have one thing. Um, so uh, on page eight of the materials that were PDF'd to us, I don't know what page that is of the minutes. Um, I didn't vote against the Two Rivers request to change commercial light industrial to business service industrial. Okay. So that should be, that should be five zero. Thank you, Mary Margaret, for clarifying that. That wasn't the... Um... That was one of the things I meant to highlight because I actually had a question about that. So, okay, I will change that. Thanks, Laura. Are there any other changes or questions that anyone has about the minutes? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Did... Oh no, I just I was scrolling through. I said, "Wow, that was a long meeting." Yeah. Um, great. Um, can uh, I make a motion to accept the minutes as uh, with the amendment just proposed by Mary Margaret? Thank you, Susan. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Any abstain? All right. The minutes pass because um, we we do have a quorum. There's four of us out of the seven, so we're in good shape. Okay. Great. Um, well, let's move on to the adjusted um, agenda items. Uh, Laura, do you yep. want to start with the website update? Or yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll keep this really brief, um, just because we haven't had time to go over it in the past uh, few meetings, and I wanted to give everybody an update about where it stands. Um, Frank and Stephen and I met in February and uh, kind of put together a loose. Uh, infrastructure, uh, information architecture um, with index cards, which was a really fun exercise. So based on that, um, and I'll share my screen if I can. Stephen, can you enable screen sharing? Yep, there you go. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to show you kind of the first step. Let me just make sure I have it up. <laughs> um, and this is a draft, um, so it's not published yet, but I can, Publish it. Here we go. Um, so we have an official planning commission page. Um, as as of right now, um, it took the efforts of many people, including not just Frank and myself, but Stephen, Nikki at Town Hall, Eric. Uh, like a lot of people were involved in just getting this because we kind of have some esoteric applications and systems. Um, that we use here in Woodstock. So um, this is just kind of like filler text for now. This isn't like anything set in stone, um, but this is just what it looks like. There's the Zoom link. The thing that I'm most excited um, 
to show you is two things actually. Um, let me just refresh this. Um, as of last week, our meeting videos are on the Woodstock Community Television YouTube channel. Um, thanks to- That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole separate group of people if you can believe it. Um, and they are incredibly short staffed. So you'll only see the last meeting up there, but the goal is to have all the 2023 meetings up there at some point over the next month. Paula, uh, a woman named Paula is working on that. Um, so that's very exciting. And then in addition to that, we have um, what I've called the document hub, which uh, Frank and I and Steven created, um, and we're still finessing and polishing everything. But the idea was that this would be where um, anybody from the public can go and access information and materials relating to the planning commission. So for example, if we go to the meeting on January 4th, we'll see the minutes, we'll see the agenda, and then any other documentation we went over during that meeting. Um, this is modeled after, as I'm sure I've said to you guys, the EDC has something similar that's very accessible. Um, I also wanted to note that Microsoft 365 and OneDrive are um, incredibly limited in what they can do. So videos will not live here because it will slow down the entire Woodstock website immensely, um, which is why the, uh, we went to YouTube. Um, but we were, I'm just like really excited about this and I'm still filling in some of the gaps um, in these meetings. But um, as soon as that page is public, um, which we could publish anytime, um, everybody will have access to this. So um, yeah, that's the update. Frank, did I forget anything? I know that was like a lot in a very short time. Not at all. Um, you always knock it out of the park as usual. Um, I think that this is awesome and I'm glad we're doing this. And I think the transparency is just another thing that we need. Yeah. I echo that. Yeah. That's such a it's such a great job, you too. Thank you so much. It's a lot of work. I know that you've been thinking about it for quite a while and working on this. Thank you. Yeah. And I really, I really thought it would it wouldn't take as long. And that was kind of my own naivete, but thankfully, Frank is uh our IT expert and knows how a lot of these things work um and was able to help out a lot. Um and and obviously um major gratitude to Steven who set this was able to set this folder up with the correct access so um anyway this took a lot of work by a lot of people it's still not done but i'm really excited about this first step um and if you have any feedback about how things are laid out or what other things you'd like to see um let me know because i'm i'm yeah we're doing it so that's it it looks wonderful yeah, and the best, the best, one of the best news is, or one of the best parts of this is when I was working with Nikki um, on the WordPress site, because she runs the town WordPress site. Um, and I was explaining to her kind of what we wanted to achieve. She's taken some of that and she's gonna, I think, slowly start implementing that for other pages. Um, okay. So that was unexpected and also really exciting. Great, great. Love that transparency. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. Um, is if there's nothing else on the website update, do you want to talk about the character survey? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Laura, I can share the map if uh, that's okay. Stephen, can you give me? Yeah. Share. You should, you should be able to do it. Okay, so um, Laura and I went out, uh, I, we had a fun time. <laughs> so I encourage you all to participate in this project. Can everyone see the map? Yes. Um, Laura and I went out and we, uh, we haven't done all the streets, although there is video now of all the streets in, in the village. So we can reference that and um, it's available for other planning commission members kind of drive by, slow drive by of both sides of the streets. We went out and we did a kind of estimated survey in terms of building setback um, as a start, as well as Laura's compiled a list that I'm working on mapping now of where are there existing accessory dwelling units and where are there um, 
um, multiple dwelling um, households. Um, so that will be two other maps. But this is the, our first pass at uh, the work that we did in the village. You can see a key um, that was added on the left-hand side about what the existing setbacks are. And I think that the big news here, frankly, and um, I've outlined each one. I've tried to replicate what a GIS map might look like, which would have been a lot easier than doing this kind of by hand. Um, but these show all the parcels as they're shown directly on the zoning map. You can see that the majority of uh, parcels and homes and buildings um, here on these streets are really below, um, it's kind of 15 feet, tw certainly 20 feet and below in terms of setback. Uh, with many of them being five to 10 feet uh, from the sidewalk. And so these buildings are very close to the street, which you know we all know um, <laughs> is kind of the traditional dense center of village New England pattern. And um, it pretty well follows through. There are a couple of places on Mountain Avenue where houses are set back and then there's Max, so, you know, um, a set back and then the, the uh, the, the motor in, um, but for the most part, it follows through with this, you know, very dense tight to the to the street edge. Um, we think this is important information to have to kind of answer questions about, you know, if we're going to shift and make minimum setbacks, I guess I would argue they should be even less than what we're proposing. Um, and if we look at some of the other streets, High Street uh, in particular, those are at zero. They are right at the sidewalk. So when we fill that in, those are all going to be yellow. Um, and so, and Gulf Avenue is also, you know, mostly in the five to 10. Um, so this is where we are. I'm committed to trying to tighten all of these up by the weekend. Um, and then we'll have a couple of verifications to do. There are some lots we have to go back, um, but we're hoping this is the beginning of, of really trying to use some data um, to help you know, inform and justify our decisions. That's it. Any questions? Laura, did I leave anything out? <laughs> No, I'll just add it was really fun and I I hope everybody can get the chance to excuse me um to do a site survey because uh Susan and I had a great time and I think it it surprised us in some ways, validated us in other ways. And I think that uh yeah, I just I would encourage everybody over the course of, of the year if if we have more needs, which I'm sure we will, it, it was a really fun time and a really great experience. Well, thank you both for for doing that. That is really helpful. And I love the visual. Like I'm a very visual person. So this mm -hmm. is particularly great for me. I think eventually yeah. what will happen is we'll just have number of parcels in each category. So we can show the percentages of the total parcels within the village, you know, kind of. So Stephen, were you going to say something or Frank? Sorry. I was just agreeing with uh, Mary Margaret on how awesome this was. Great work. Thank you for doing it. It's awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if there are no other um, questions or preliminary agenda items, we can roll right into the, um, the Twin Pines presentation. And Mary Margaret, just to let you know, as a courtesy, I'm going to be switching to my phone and we'll have video off for most of it, but I'll be fully present. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Be calling back in. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And if, if I can sneak in there while the while the guys come up to the table, um, I just want to introduce Stephanie, who is the new assistant who started, let's see, you're now in your second week, uh, currently yeah. remote in from... Yeah, usually you sit there. It doesn't really matter. Um, well, I'm over here. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, we're getting positioned. Stephanie is joining us tonight from Thank Austin, you. Texas, but they are soon moving up this way. Um, so even as soon as maybe the next couple weeks, but at least in the next yeah. month or so. Uh, we'll yeah, see. absolutely. And it's great to meet you all. Glad to be here. <laughs> Glad to have you. What, how many, um, are you full time? Are you going to be full time or what's your? I am full time. Yep. Yeah. Great. 
Do you want to give like a one sentence or two sentences just about kind of who you are and? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, um, I have a real estate background. I've been in commercial and residential real estate my whole life and I'm making the switch over to the planning department after working here in my um, county, my local county planning office. So really excited to get up to Woodstock. Good. Well, what, what, Me too. All. Glad to have you. Thanks. Now we'll let, go ahead. Sure, okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, again, um, Andrew Winter, I'm Executive Director at Twin Pines Housing Trust. I'm delighted to be here today uh, with me. Uh, Matt, ben, uh, Matt Giffen from Banwell Architects, um, who has worked with us on several projects um, and is working with us um, on the potential redevelopment of Mellish Woods. Um, so just to kind of give a little bit of context, um, Twin Pines uh, purchased the property uh, consisting of four buildings at 34 and 36 uh, Pleasant Street um, at the end of the year, uh, November of last year, uh, from um, the original family that developed um, uh, the property uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, there are, for those of you not familiar with the property, there are four uh, structures currently on the on the site. Um, two historic buildings um, located uh, right along um, uh, Pleasant Street, approximately uh, set back. Probably, I think I think the the, the survey said 16 to 20 feet uh, from from the sidewalk. Um, uh, one brick, one uh, white clabbered. Um, dating from about 1830s. Um, and then two uh, additional buildings that were constructed at the, the rear of the site in the 1970s. Um, a total of 26 units. Uh, the buildings um, in the front, one's four, uh, the brick building, seven units, back building, seven units, um, uh, and eight units um, in the rear. Again, total of, of 26 units. Um, we are as part of our process of acquiring uh, the property, looking at uh, replacing um, one of the, or excuse me, the buildings in the rear, we would keep the historic buildings in the front. Um, but as part of that, wanted to have a conversation with you all about uh, a number of options and kind of considerations that we have as we're looking to, to redevelop the site. So let me just give a little bit of context for what we're, what we're doing. So, this, uh, the 26 units are uh, senior housing, uh, affordable senior housing. So these are subsidized units. Um, many of the, the residents um, have uh, very low income, um, uh, but, um, and really depend on this, this housing as a critical part of, of um, you know, being here in the Woodstock community. Um, as part of our review, uh, we, you know, have done some analysis of the buildings. Um, and there are uh, a number of deficiencies around um, access primarily. Um, none of the buildings have elevators um, or other mechanisms for, uh, or lifts uh, to allow uh, seniors to get in and out of the building um, if their mobility should decline over time. Um, but they're also incredibly energy inefficient. Uh, the back buildings, uh, typical for buildings in the 1970s when people Put them up. Uh, they said, "Great electric heat. Uh, it's two cents a kilowatt uh, hour," and um, and so um, they still have electric uh, an electric storage uh, heating storage system. Um, but the buildings themselves um, have um, deficient windows. Um, mold uh, is an issue, um, and um, so uh, for those reasons, we really want to look at um, replacing them. Um, we're early in the process to be clear for everyone. This is, this is not, we're not coming to you today with plans. Uh, obviously, um, this is really sort of to get your, your initial take on things. We met with Stephen uh, and uh, Eric, the town manager to kind of talk about this a little bit last week. And, um, you know, based on, on that discussion, thought it would be helpful to kind of talk with you all about um, some concepts for um, redeveloping the property. Um, so with that, is that 
Yep. A good start. I'll I'll turn it over over to Matt yep. um, to kind of uh, go through some of the some of the the considerations that we'd like to discuss and get your your thoughts on today. Yep. And uh, um, my understanding, the the goal of this meeting was uh, less to chat about our project and just more of the concept of what is on the docket to discuss today about building height. Um, and so uh, Steve invited us in just so that I could share some of our um, quote unquote challenges. Um, and um, like I mentioned, this is, this is less about Mellish, but more about kind of what you're discussing and, and kind of the, the challenges that we're, we're running into. So um, the existing zoning regulations are 35 feet. Uh, we are bouncing around the idea of how many units we can fit on the site. And there's a few different other zoning components to that that may or may not impact how many um, units we can have on the site. But the the in particular, the building height was one of them. And uh, that struck a chord with Steve. So he asked me to come in here and share this diagram that I had put together uh, for, for internally. But um, I think it's a good diagram to share with all of you. So with a 35-foot building height, um, Andrew mentioned that uh, him and I worked together on another project. So I designed the Summer Park uh, residences in, in Hanover, New Hampshire. They have a similar 35 foot uh, uh, um, building height as well. They have a few exceptions where, for example, example parapets can go beyond um, 35 feet, elevator overruns, mechanical units can go above. Um, it seemed like your zoning regs were a little bit more vague and maybe there was some wiggle room there, um, but reading the letter of the law, I couldn't have a two foot parapet going beyond the, the, the um, 35 feet, for example. So uh, at Summer Park, we needed three stories. Um, and with three stories, not counting the, um, the parapets, we were at 34 feet, eight inches. Um, and that is on a flat site. Um, I think they measure this the similar way that you did. So if I'm on a sloped hill, it gets measured from the average, for example. Um, so, and that was very tight. We ran into some issues during construction. Um, 35 feet probably made sense back in the day when ventilation was less of an issue. Now we have massive duct work going through all these buildings. They're um, between ventilation standards and how tight buildings are. There's just a lot of kind of guts in the, in the ceilings above, um, between the ceilings and the floor above. So that results in needing additional um, inches and feet between the ceiling and the floor. So once you factor in how thick that, that ceiling to floor dimension is, how thick the roof dimension is, um, there really isn't much options to get a three-story building except to go a flat roof. Um, and I don't wanna get into the necessarily the design, but if I'm um, sitting on the DRB, I don't necessarily want a three-story flat roof building right in the middle of the village of, of Woodstock. So, I, and I would be a little nervous to even present that. Um, ideally, I could make a gabled three-story roof work. Um, however, if you can see on the right there, a three-story gabled roof with a 412 pitch, um, that would be 39 feet measured to the middle. And that's, you know, this is a very vague diagrammatic sketch here. So there's thicknesses and whatnot and, and other sort of nuances that could throw that off a little bit. Um, but if I wanted a three-story gabled roof, I'm having to go with a pretty flat gabled roof and I'm four feet above what's allowed. Um, if I wanted to do a two-story gabled roof, um, you can see there that at a similar 412 pitch, that's 28 feet. Uh, so that's essentially all that we would be capable of doing if we're not willing to consider a flat roof. And then on the left side there, I threw in a sketch of what a flat roof system might look like. And you can see there, I think the dimension came out to 34 feet eight. Uh, and that's that's given in, in all of these scenarios, that's an 11 foot floor to floor uh, with an assumption of a two foot roof structure. And that's what it was at Summer Park. It was 11 feet floor to floor. And uh, we ran into some issues in the corridors where all of a sudden ductwork wasn't fitting and we had to build in soffits and drop ceilings. And it was it was very, very tight and really limited kind of what we were able to do. So uh, if I can just jump in there, just yep. to provide a little bit of context, um, for those of you who who may find yourselves uh, occasionally in Hanover, uh, this summer park property was a property we worked uh, with the town of Hanover, uh, formerly uh, formerly owned by the town of Hanover. They uh, sold it to to Twin Pines for a dollar, uh, with uh, the understanding or the requirement that we redevelop the property uh, to to create um, 
there were 24 units of existing senior housing built in the 1970s. Uh, and we, we uh, ultimately, uh, because the town also gave us land, uh, additional land um, adjacent to the senior housing development, the original senior housing development, we were able to increase the number of units in that instance uh, from 24 to 42 units. Um, it's located directly across the street uh, from um, Hanover High School. Um, and where, you know, perhaps the flat roof at the high school, this, this sort of reads more like the high school building in terms of um, it being acceptable to have a flat roof. Uh, again, a different situation than here, but if you're in Hanover and you want to see what it looks like, um, it's, it's right there uh, on Lebanon Street across from Hanover High School. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and again, this is really kind of, I, I believe the intent of us coming here was to kind of speak more just conceptual high level, just to help aid in your um, your thought process. Um, but to get a little bit more specific, how it relates back to Mellishwood, um, like I said, there's a couple of different scenarios that will factor into how many units we can replace it with. Um, but let's envision a scenario where we can't put as many units as we would like to put on the, 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 the site. Um, so we want to put X amount of the um, units on the site. Let's say we can put, um, um, we can only put back what's there, which was uh, 15, I believe, right? Um, so if we, the site is very, very tight. So a two-story, 15-unit building takes up a significant portion of that site to the point where we can't even have an access road going around like it is now. It creates a very tight site. Um, it makes it difficult for fire truck access. It's all doable, um, but I'm quite sure that the fire department would say, man, ideally we would have a different scenario. Now, if we could go to a three-story structure, whether that's with a flat roof, um, again, not ideally, or with a, with a three-story pitched roof, now we can pick up, we can relocate those couple end bays and put them up top. So now the actual square footage of the site is being reduced because we can go vertical instead of, instead of out. Um, so uh, on the second sheet there, uh, I have a floor plan. Um, Steve's pulling it up momentarily. Uh, so th this is very conceptual. This is, um, we're still in the works here. Um, but on the, the detailed floor plan on the left is what a 15 unit uh, building would look like um, if it was two stories. And then I have the diagram on the right where, okay, if we can go three stories, now we can add an additional nine units or you could visually see that we can relocate those two end units and put them up top or even um, three of the end units or even four of the end units and put them up top. So uh, really that additional, uh, even if you go from 35 feet to 40 feet, it's, it's amazing what kind of opportunity that opens up. Um, like I said, we could still do a flat roof and get three stories, but I don't think that's what you really want here. I think you would rather have an aesthetically pleasing, more contextual uh, type of three-story building. It, uh, one other thing, uh, observation to kind of um, make is that, you know, part of <laughs> this discussion will help uh, inform how we approach, um, you know, potentially renovating the front buildings. So, as I mentioned, the two historic structures at the front, one's four units, the white uh, uh, clabbered building, and then seven units um, in the in the brick building. Um, the ideally we're we are going to be doing, I mean, we are going to be doing significant renovations in those buildings. They were modestly renovated back in the 1970s um, and are in serious need of upgrade at this point from an energy efficiency perspective, which is something that we strive with all of our projects. Uh, Matt's worked with us on doing uh, passive house certified uh, buildings. Um, the, the Hanover building that we talked about was a passive house certified building. Um, so very energy efficient. Uh, really spending a lot of time and effort on on the envelope and making sure that um, we're we're doing all the air sailing to kind of make it as efficient as possible. We're not going to necessarily be able to achieve that with a historic structure, but we want to improve the energy efficiencies of the buildings. But we also really need to figure out accessibility. And, and one way to do that is to actually potentially reduce the number of units in some of those buildings and relocate them to the back building. Um, so height, height matters. Um, uh, if, if we're going to have the ability to do that as well, because then, you know, we can obviously put more units in, the more we can go up. Great. And uh, I guess the last thing that I would say, um, and then we can get to any questions if there are any, um, if we can go back to that first page and zoom in on the three-story gabled roof. Um, 
That diagram shows a 412 pitch uh, given a 72 foot wide building, uh, given an 11 foot floor to floor, right? So those are three very specific um, parameters that I've that I've given here. Um, these particular units, it's it's uh, you know it's it's affordable um, senior living, so we don't have these big luscious units. They're very compact, efficient. Um, so uh, other buildings, they may go quite a bit wider because there our units are probably 26 feet deep. Other more luxurious units might be 35 feet deep. So the moment that building starts getting wider, the moment that building starts getting a higher floor to floor, and the moment you start going above a 412 pitch. All of that obviously increases the building height. And I just wanted to point out, I believe Steve mentioned that you were considering changing it from 35 to 40. Um, I can say the 40 would help us immensely, but you may wanna consider how much higher than 40 you'd be willing to go, um, kind of given those three parameters that I've assumed in this sketch. Um, you know, the, the more ventilation requirements that are needed, the, the more critical that floor to floor dimension gets. Uh, a 412 pitch is, you know, maybe that's that's appropriate for a, a taller building, but I personally like 512s, 612s is aesthetically how I like buildings. Um, so I just wanted to point out that that 40 feet that I'm showing works is given us a very specific set of circumstances. Um, any Anything else, Steve, you think we should cover? Or did we have any questions? Yeah. Um, if I could just point it a little bit, could you guys talk to talk a little bit about the the existing parking, um, how, if at all, if you expanded the units, um, the way our regulations would currently, how that would affect your parking? Um, sure. Sure. So um, currently there are approximately uh, 26 uh, to 29 parking spaces. The spaces themselves, it's a gravel lot um, located at the back of the property and on one side between uh, the Shire and uh, and uh, the white building uh, at Mellish Woods, um, that that gravel lot is not lined, so the exact number of spaces is somewhat open to how well people park. Uh, but um, but suffice it to say that there is roughly um, one to one uh, parking to unit uh, right now, far below the 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 two uh, spaces required per unit under your existing code. Um, I will say, you know, we we encourage we're encouraging communities to, to where we're working to think about um, reducing the parking requirements, particularly for senior housing. Um, we worked uh, closely with the town of Hanover uh, in redoing the senior housing uh, in uh, it's called Summer Park uh, to reduce the parking uh, from 1.5, which was their requirement to um, actually 0.75 um, based on historic data from similar senior housing projects and frankly, what they had seen with the 24 units um, historically uh, there. They had been operating uh, for, for, for nearly 50 years. So they knew uh, that the parking demand was far less um, than 1.5. So uh, we did uh, get uh, town approval to, to uh, and uh, town meeting approval to go to 0.75 for senior housing. And as part of that, um, that has been, you know, plenty adequate uh, for that population in part because um, low income seniors, uh, particularly um, as we find that many of the seniors in these communities are um, aging. Um, they are not folks in their 60s and 70s. There are folks in their 60s, 70s, 80s into their 90s. Uh, the older they are, uh, given low incomes, they, they are often less likely to have a vehicle um, and certainly less likely to have a vehicle over time. So um, that is something that, you know, if the, if the, if the planning uh, board were, were willing to entertain uh, the concept of reducing uh, parking requirements, uh, particularly for senior housing, would allow us to potentially have more units um, while, while still having sufficient parking uh, for the residents. Yep, and, and um, we, we haven't really fully thought out what makes sense in our opinion for this site. Uh, the Hanover project is right in the middle of town and I can see a scenario where less people would need cars. Uh, Mellishwood is still pretty close to town, less though directly in town. So I don't know if we would go after 0.75. It's with, but... Yeah, it's within walking distance of the supermarket, just like, right. just yep. like in Hanover. Um, it is connected to the downtown. Um, 
by by sidewalk. Um, and you know, frankly, the community benefits from the Thompson Senior Center, the rides that it provides, the location of the Ottaquichi Health uh, Center right next door to Mellish Woods. So there's a lot to recommend this site as an as an in town location mm -hmm. that might make it more appropriate for a reduction in 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 parking requirements. Yep. So. And the reason I was mentioning that is we. Uh, I believe we, we, we've done conceptual layouts for the site, and I think we found that we can fit just about one for one on the site now. Yeah. Um, once, we've, once we've kind of reconfigured the site, so we can not comfortably fit one for one, but we, we, could, we could fit one for one. Um, but that's, again, far below the two. The far below the two, yep. Um, and if the, the, two, the two parking spots per unit was, was held up and there was no wiggle room there, that actually will take away what our options are in constructing the building. We'll just run out of space to build. Um, so it's just kind of a, it would be a really unfortunate scenario where we can't build the amount of units that are needed because of how much parking is needed, especially when the when all the dust settled, you would look and 50% of the parking spots would never actually be used. So that, that would just be a really kind of unfortunate situation to, to, to be in. And uh, did we want to chat at all about the um, the kind of the ratio that determines lot size relative to number of units, or is that a, a different topic for a different time? Yeah. So, so maybe just on the on the idea of the existing variance for density sure. that is currently there mm -hmm. and is essentially still in place since the original waiver back in the seventies, yeah, the mid seventies. So right the, after we adopted zoning. Yeah, so the, this this project, when it was uh, developed, um, uh, would uh, allow for 16 units under uh, base zoning, um, a 50% um, uh, increase for um, uh, for being affordable housing to um, 24 units, and then in this case, actually, it did receive a variance um, back in the 70s uh, from 24 units, um, as we understand it, to to, to to the current 26 units. So this is, you know, essentially what we're looking at is a scenario where there's an existing variance in place, but if you're taking a building down or taking two buildings down in the back to try to create one new building that is fully accessible and energy efficient and code compliant, um, you know, we have we have an issue in terms of the existing um, what what the existing lot would allow by right. Which is actually something that we, as a planning commission, have not specifically taken up um, for the plan unit development. Um, so, yet again, another thing we might have in these amendments that we're actively working on. That's all I had. If, if yeah. You no, that's. I mean, again, we we wanted to kind of, <laughs> as we're starting to think about this, uh, looking to 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 put some plans together over the the next few months uh, and then come back. Um, we would expect to come back to you in the uh, in the summer to fall. Well, at this point, I think probably more the fall. Um, but we are anxious to move this forward um, this year. Um, the project, the, the property, um, just to make your problems or my problems, your problems, uh, the building was um, the buildings were are inspected annually uh, by the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and it's and they're scored on a scale of one to a hundred. Uh, like uh, every grade school kid, you know that sixty is not where you want to be. This property came in at sixty three, uh, so um, it it is one of the lowest scored properties that anybody has seen in 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 Vermont. Um, it's just really tough shape and so um uh, we're anxious to move it forward um with your help uh we um we can apply for the funding that we need to renovate this property and replace uh you know replace at least the back buildings um only once a year and um and that 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 deadline for us uh is january so we'll need to have you know sort of work over the coming months through various applications. The big piece of this is some federal tax credits. And again, once a year, January, you find out about it in April. Um, so, um, you know, if you if we can't kind of get ourselves moving forward through this this year, then we're in a situation where we're, we're sort of kicking it over another, uh, a whole nother year 
um, before we can um, mm -hmm. actually have the financing in hand to undertake renovations of the property. So happy to happy to take questions, and I know Matt is as well. Um, Mary Margaret, I I have questions. Doesn't matter what order, Susan. Okay. Um, well, um, I think Laura, Laura, why don't you go first, and then Susan, you're you're up next. Sure. Um, thank you guys for this presentation. It, it's incredibly helpful to kind of see in real life application. Um, I was wondering, and I apologize if you went over this, but um, you mentioned that the roof pitch that you would like to see is more like 512, 612. And I'm wondering what, what height those two would come in at if you were to... Um, if you were to if you were to make the roof those pitches, if I still had my geometry skills, I'd be able to do the uh, the a squared plus b squared equals c squared math for you. Uh, I don't know exactly, uh, but okay. I can I can update a diagram and I can I can email that over. Yeah, I'm just curious because I I thought you mentioned and correct me if I'm wrong that they are more consistent and more maybe visually pleasing and certainly if we're if we're all agreeing that a flat roof is like not where we want to be <laughs> i would just love to know what the like matching ideal state especially for the character um for the character of the area we're talking about is um and 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 use that as an anchor rather than like what the bare minimum is that we could get away with a pitched roof right it, it's it's a really good question um and i don't know how i don't know if there's really much of an answer so um the, the 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 diagrams are based off of a quote like more or less a rectangular box right um, and so it, it's a pretty geometrically simple building where, where one conti continuous gable roof might make sense maybe I'll throw in a little bit of of jogging here or there um, however if if there was a different type of project with uh, you know a much higher budget you know whatever it might be you might end up with different scenarios where a 12 12 pitch makes sense on this section and a 4 12 makes sense here um, and it really my point was if 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 you're if you're trying to figure out what that height is the higher it is it, the more flexibility people get with um like with those roof pitches and and honestly if if my favorite pitch might be 512 612 someone else's might be 12 12 someone else's yeah. so it, it's it's more of an opinion for me and i i'd hate for my opinion to to make much of an impact on on any of your decisions um but, but really it was just kind of a matter of and maybe I can just send you a couple different diagrams of okay, a twelve pelt twelve would match out this, um, and then so maybe you could take that information and say, okay, the average of the roofs have to average out to this. So maybe you can have a twelve twelve pitch at forty three as long as it averages out to forty. Um, you, know, you can get a little bit creative, like some town some towns do with that. Okay, no, that's very helpful. Yeah, and I would I would personally it would be really great to just have these diagrams. Um, we can put them in our folder, our shared folder, um, so we can reference them. They're very helpful. Yep, will do. I think it's a great, a great question. And also, with the minimum pitch, are we meeting the maximum um, insulation? Are we meeting all of those regulations? Yep. Yeah. The the, the, the shallower the pitch, the harder it is. But you can. It it gets blown into the attic and. Maybe it gets reduced a little bit um, at the edges of the building where that roof pinches. But for the most part, yeah, that with, with a slope roof, you're blowing cellulose into an attic space. You're not necessarily stacking insulation on top. Um, but, it, but it's a good point. I mean, it's the more flexibility on the building height, the better, um, obviously, but we, we don't want to get too carried away here. <laughs> we, we, um, but I will say as a general matter, um, because this is a state, uh, will be a state and federally funded project, will be, con um, conforming to uh, uh, efficiency Vermont's high performance home standards. So, so there is a, there is a standard uh, in terms of energy, a minimum energy efficiency that, um, that we um, will build to. Um, we have done uh, passive house. We haven't talked about passive house here. And for those of you who may be less familiar with that concept um, in Germany, uh, the idea of, of, of super insulating your buildings, um, you know, triple glazed windows, really sort of um, making sure that you're doing a great job of air sealing. Typically uh, uses about 80% less energy 
um, than uh, a, a code compliant uh, building. So we've done a bunch of them in Vermont, excuse me, in New Hampshire, um, and we've come close in Vermont, um, but um, you know, that's something that we'll be looking at as well in this instance as we think about uh, the best way to, uh, to move this forward. Great. Um, Susan, did you have a question? I do. I have some comments and some questions. So I think, you know, thank you for this presentation. This certainly checks a lot of the boxes of what we know Woodstock needs, right? We need affordable housing um, for seniors. Uh, we want to encourage walkable community. Uh, the location is great for that. We've been talking about reducing um, or eliminating parking, you know, minimums. Um, so I think kind of on a broad range, just to give you background, I'm an architect and a city planner, but on a broad range, it would be helpful to always have these drawings in context, because as a planning commission, you know, we're looking at the existing zoning but we're also concerned, as we saw earlier with this character survey, the zoning doesn't necessarily get us what we want or even the existing conditions that we have now if we had to rebuild. So putting these in context, even just kind of a height massing within the site um, would be really useful um, um, so that we can understand, you know, if a building's at the rear of the property, it's not right at the street edge, can it go higher and why should it? Um, and I and I think that from an urban design point of view, the height matters in how it affects the street and kind of the overall kind of um, civic space. And so thinking of we've been talking a little bit about design, you started talking about or maybe it's an undulating front or there are different pitches can really help us get beyond the monolithic box to understand how design might play into this. And that's exciting. Um, so I guess I'm going to throw something out there that my, no one on this commission may agree with except for me, but um, having presented to a lot of commissions and heard lots of presentations, you're presenting to us as kind of squeezing past what, you know, trying to push the envelope a little bit in terms of what current Woodstock zoning will allow. Um, we are all working to be more progressive and also proactive about getting the kind of denser village, walkable, supporting local businesses that we want. I'm wondering what this would look like if you were less afraid about proposing something really innovative <laughs> and, and, and wondering if it would take on a different look. Would it be denser? Would you try something different? Um, it would be interesting to know. I, I, I wouldn't be scared by seeing that. Could be kind of exciting. And then I guess the last thing is we also know that we need affordable workforce housing. And so the question is, and it might be what you're limited to in terms of funding sources, HUD funding, your financing stack, but is it possible to think about doing some integrated workforce housing in this project as well. Is there a way to section out the front buildings um, so you can look at a different financing source or whatever so that we get just more than senior housing? That's it, sorry for rambling. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on the, the, um, the funding issues. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this this housing uh, is there is a restriction on it uh, imposed as part of the uh, Woodstock's uh, town approval that it be used uh, only for senior housing. So probably easier for you to undo Woodstock uh, and what what Woodstock um, required of it. Uh, the harder part is is the HUD financing and the ability to kind of un, undo that. Um, mm -hmm. and we you know uh, again we. Um, in an effort to, to try to ensure and protect this, uh, this resource, um, we agreed with HUD that we would operate it as senior housing. And while I am totally, um, you know, love the idea of, of workforce housing and integrated workforce housing uh, into some of the senior housing, unfortunately, um, this one does not seem like there is a, a very easy path forward um, with, with the state and uh, HUD in terms of undoing it and creating uh, an opportunity to do workforce housing. Totally get it. Um, we've done some workforce housing. We're doing some home ownership in town. Um, 
would love to be doing more and uh, will be doing more, but um, this is probably um, best treated as if it were senior housing. I will, I will turn it over to Matt to kind of get his take on on how we're thinking about um, the building. Um, you know, obviously one of I will say one of the limitations, not only you know the zoning limitations, not only the population that we're trying to serve in terms of uh, restrictions on the property, but the other piece is the fact that it's, um, you know, we've got these historic buildings in the front and really trying to think about how we address those, how we potentially integrate those, how we try to um, potentially, you know, think about um, uh, creating an opportunity to improve accessibility to those, uh, to the historic building, particularly the brick historic building in a way that um, uh, is, is, is visually appealing um, you know, um, you know, again, um, I appreciate the fact that, you know, we're, we're coming in just to kind of, um, I, I don't want to say spitball ideas, but basically try to, you know, get, get some input around and, and provide some input around, um, height and the impact of height. Um, it's not intended, this was not intended to obviously provide, you know, a, a, a full plan or concept. Um, that's something that, you know, if there is interest, then we can we can come back um, um, with with some other plans. Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm I'm a little giddy from your comment on saying, "Hey, Matt, to make something contemporary and modern and and, and less downtown Woodstocky." I would love that. Um, what, maybe you could check out the Twin Pines website and just see some photos of their portfolio. You'll see that uh, just the budget the budget in Ver for Vermont projects is better than New Hampshire. Sure. Um, but but we certainly don't have the funds that I would like to have for for a, for you know a an, um, you know kind of a crazy design something like that. So typically, uh, I, I don't know how much our options are to get super creative with with different forms and pitches and 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 you know all these different things. We'll have to kind of play. Typically, these um, you know the rate of inflation is is doing this and what Vermont New Hampshire is is giving us for increases is doing this so the gap it, it seems to be growing um but hey if if there's some interest in Woodstock of of doing something less less uh um <laughs> New England Vermonty um, I'm all for it I just didn't really think there would be the appetite but if if we think there are then that's something that we can explore but yeah and I think the one I was referring to I mean I don't know if it would be less Woodstocky, but just thinking about how, um, you know, thinking about different pitches or whatever it is might get you dormers that might get another level that, you know, doesn't appear like another level, but it's, it's less about just, you know, doing something crazy for crazy sake, but is there a way to use the forms that actually gets more units? which then, you know, kind of helps pay for any of those, you know, alterations, you know, every time you, you know, change a corner, it's going to cost you money. Yep. Um, just, just thinking about how to be a bit creative on that. And I'm sure you're thinking that I, I just think that, you know, as a planning commission, we've spent a lot of time over the past half a year or more actually now um, about how we can encourage more affordable housing. And so I think we're all open to kind of thinking in partnership about this. I'm just going to speak for myself. Sorry, I shouldn't speak for the whole commission. Um, yep. Yeah. So yeah, you know, one one idea that was on the table was kind of a two and a half story um, type building, and mm -hmm. that's certainly an option. Um, it, it limits the amount of of rooms you can have on that top story. Um, mm -hmm. Just so you know, the yeah, I was going to say. I mean, we, you know, if 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 people want to look at what that might look like, a three-story building with a shed dormer, um, on our website, um, there's an, we are doing an 18-unit building for the chronically homeless. Um, this is a building in in um, Hartford on um, Hartford Ave. It's going to be starting construction uh, in June, and that that's a building where we did use sort of a shed dormer uh, roof line as a way to take a uh, three, what is essentially a three-story building and make it feel more like a two-story building or two and a half story building. Um, so that, that is, that is, you know, a concept of, of something that we could look at here um, um, as a way to kind of try to, you know, reduce the overall sense of mass. 
That's great. Um, this is fantastic. Um, I, um, I, I have a comment and a question, but I just want to start out by saying, you know, I'm a huge fan of Twin Pines and Andrew, I've known you for a decade. So I really, uh, I've always admired your work and I'm psyched um, that you're here tonight um, and really appreciate um, your time and Matt's time um, to present to us. Um, so just a comment, um, uh, Matt, I think you had mentioned something about the two parking um, space issue. That's something that this committee has talked about um, and uh, is uh, actively addressing. So um, we've heard concerns similar to yours and it's something that we're definitely taking up. Um, and so my question is, um, you know, kind of on the flip side, I mean, I understand that, you know, higher gets you more. I'm just curious, um, you know, if you had to stay at the 35 foot, if it's a two couple part question. So if you had to stay at the 35 foot level, you know, when is it not viable um, for, you know, from a Twin Pines perspective, you know, to really invest in something like this? Um, so that's part of it. And then I think you said that in Hanover, I think you said that they kept it at the 35 foot limit, but they had a variant for maybe a parapet, maybe elevator stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious, you know, if you had to stay at that 35 foot level, what would that look like? Is that an insurmountable barrier or is that something that you can get around? You know, the, what it ends up with is a, a, a building that is longer, bigger, and, um, you know, in, in terms of trying to create uh, this, the the footprint that we need to get 15 units, uh, no less than 15 units into it. Um, you know, I'm committed to redoing the housing uh, because, again, it's it's a 63. I, I, I go back to the score that we got. Uh, or the the prior owner got right before we bought the place, um, and it, it's indicative of a property that really needs a significant um, uh, upgrade, and that's that's true whether it's two stories, three stories, or thirty stories. Um, so we're we're going to be you know figuring out a way to to do this as best we can. I I will say I think there's opportunities to do this that um, you know reduce the visual impact, and in in some ways by having and we can. We can bring this to you, but you know, by having the the new structure in the back be three stories, but set back uh, behind the existing historic building, um, you know, it it allows us by going up allows us to have less um, of a, a footprint overall. Probably improves some of the the circulation around the site, um, but it also affords us the opportunity to potentially think about more units at a time when we're desperately needing more units and more units that are affordable for a range of folks and for, for seniors who are looking to stay here uh, in, 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 in Woodstock and in the Upper Valley, there are very, very limited options uh, for seniors. And, and this is really an opportunity and it is a, a once in a generation opportunity uh, to, to kind of think boldly about what we can do. So um, going up lets us be a little bit bolder. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, uh, no, I, I didn't want to, I wasn't implying that that's where I wanted to stick. I was just curious. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and no, here I mean, it's a once in a generation opportunity. That's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, you know, this property, uh, as I mentioned, was originally developed in the 70s, hasn't gotten uh, an investment. Um, we've got momentum to get this investment now in the sense that I think a lot of the state funders, I think our, our, our congressional delegation uh, Senator Sanders staff has toured this facility. Uh, they know the condition. They, we've talked with them about, um, you know, congressionally directed spending as a way to help address this um, uh, uh, real critical need um, for, for a new investment. But it is, it is, you get a bite at the apple once every 40 years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so Fr Frank or um, Brad, do either of you have questions? So I was just thinking about even, um, even sticking at that 35, like a flat roof building there, I don't see that as being bad for the character because it would be sat back behind mm -hmm. those other existing historic buildings. And honestly, as someone who lives in that area of the town, 
having that extra height would be more of a visual impact for people because you, you have the view out over the sure. the river over yep. the farm like the valley so that extra height even if it's a pitched roof like i don't necessarily see why it would need to be a pitched roof there yeah i mean i i think um that's that's helpful uh obviously a helpful perspective uh the adequichi health foundation or a, a health center uh building has a, a flat roof as you know um there just there aren't uh if we were further downtown <laughs> yeah. you know uh uh we've got lots of flat roof buildings but in that location there that's really the only example that i can think of in that immediate area so um, yeah with that flat roof diagram there uh, i'm showing an eight inch water table um and then 34 feet eight so you know we're kind of right at that that 35 feet height um, so with elevators, um, you, uh, elevators require an overrun above them. Um, that typically stip, sticks up about four feet. Uh, they put, you know, there's machine parts and big steel beams that carry it and mechanical and whatnot. So that would stick up. Uh, we, uh, with, with these high performance buildings, it, they're all electric now, um, not the same type of electric built back in the 70s, right? But with heat pumps. And um, so those typically go on the roof. Um, so then all of a sudden you're getting these six, eight foot tall units on top of the roof. Um, so we threw in some parapets uh, to, to help conceal that. Um, the, we had a bunch of solar on the roof. The solar is completely concealed. Even when you're on the, the third, even if you're on the roof of the high school, you probably can't see the solar because of those parapets. So uh, I haven't had the opportunity to do a new construction project in Hanover. So I don't know what kind of wiggle room there is with that 35 foot height relative to elevator overruns and mechanical units and whatnot. Um, but if there's a scenario where there is, if it's 35 feet and literally nothing can go over it, uh, a flat roof actually doesn't work. Um, we, we would need some help there to, to exceed that 35 feet to put mechanical units up there and elevator overrun, um, you know, something like that. Well, we've been talking about upping it to 40 feet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the ongoing discussion that we've, that we've been having. Yeah about whether to up it um 40 feet has been thrown out i mean i think even our in our in our last i mean we've, we've done math all across the board oh, yeah uh, we've gone up we've gone stay the same so we're we're Hard somewhere to where we're at yeah which is also just the exact timing when these guys happen to be working and go huh We've been talking all about the things you're doing. <laughs> so. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I guess my only question would be like, what, what are the next steps and what do we need to be thinking about? Like they talk about a timeline for January for funding. Like, what does this look like so we can be prepared? Yeah, Stephen, do you know, like, if we were to make changes on the planning commission, where, when would that need to happen by in order for it to be fine? Yeah, I mean, it, it, if we're looking at, at kind of when, when's the, when's the last moment, <laughs> like, when, when's our deadline for, for passing or for the planning commission sending policy to, to the trustees? I would say, let me count. I would say like September 1st is, would be my, like my comfortable, like it's out of the planning commission's hand, full draft, like sent with report to the trustees, like for approval. Okay. Um, and then, so Matt and Andrew, if, sure. um, so I'm going to try to summarize what I, I heard your recommendations are, and you tell me if this is if this is accurate. So you're recommending that we go down from two parking spaces to at least one. There's some discussion back and forth if it's 0.75 or or one um, for senior. There was um, a recommendation to go up to well to to at a minimum not have a hard um, cap at 35, maybe go up to 40. I think Laura asked you if 
you know, really what you uh, would um, envision if there were no barriers, um, but let's say 40. And what, what else? I mean, those are the, the two main points that yeah. we, we had a third, but I don't think it's really worth, I don't know if this is the time or place, but, um, but they did that, but you hit it on the head with those two points. You might as well lay out the third. I mean, if we're making changes. <laughs> we've, uh, got, we've, got, we've got their attention. <laughs> Thank you. You're for here. So we've completely commandeered this meeting. So I, I apologize. Okay, I'm going to stop splitting minutes on the next two <laughs> items on agendas. Uh, the, I, do, do we want to get into the, the density? Well, briefly, yeah, maybe. Sure. I mean, you can, if you want to touch on the density. Yeah. So uh, as we mentioned before, uh, the, the way that it's determined on how many units can be on a site is you take your total square foot, um, you divide it by a certain number, and then that gives you how many units that you have. Um, when you do that math, that equals, uh, when you take our total site, divide it by what that factor is, that the results in us being allowed to have 24 units. Um, as previously mentioned, we uh, there was a variance that was obtained decades ago to have two more. So we actually have two more than what zoning allows. Um, so at the very least, we would we would hope that that variance could could travel with us with this new building. Um, but as you might imagine, um, ideally, we could put more units on this site. Um, and I understand that in order to do that, that's quite the challenge. Um, and we wonder if and, and I'll apologize if I'm getting this uh, the language incorrectly. Um, but the, so the plan residential development um, allows for an increase of 25 percent to 50 percent. So when I say we have. Uh, we have two more than what's allowed. That's assuming that we got the 50% density Im uh, improvement. I wonder if there would be a scenario where the town would allow up to 100% density uh, increase for um, workforce housing, low income projects, because uh, obviously the more that we can bring into the downtown setting, the better, the more um, affordable housing that we can give, the better. Um, and, and just kind of realistically, like I said, these are very compact units. Uh, the whole units are probably 700 square feet. Um, these aren't big, luxurious, 2,000 square foot, three bedroom units. Um, they're one beds at 700 square feet. Or 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 or, or less. Or six between 600 and 650 as well. Yep. Six, know, yep. At, at Summer Park. Yep. So. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so six 650 uh, uh, net. Um, so Twin Pines would love to put more units on there. We envision that the only way that would be possible is if there would be a change to that plan residential development multiplier, and maybe specifically that could be for low income workforce housing, where just naturally those units would be smaller. Great, thank you. Another point to think about. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else from anyone um, else on the commission or Stephen? Um, well, I guess I'm curious, uh, the parking thing, you said in other communities, you've seen less of it, like a 75% need. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing at that site specifically? Uh, well, I drove by and I looked and it looked about 75% empty or, you know, 75% uh, uh, occupied. Yeah. So it, um, you know, as I I, 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 I could have done a, a drive through, I took a quick glance and there was certainly a lot of empty spaces. I mean, again, you know, having a little bit of wiggle room um, is, is not always a problem, like going up to from 0.75 to one, uh, because you may find that, you know, somebody has a caregiver or somebody who's yeah. providing direct services to a resident or a visitor that is who is coming in. Um, you know, this location uh, historically, in some ways, has benefited from the fact that it's adjacent to the the health center, uh, because that has. There are people who show up. They they can't figure out the driveways. We're going to fix the driveways. There are three driveways going into the property. There will be two, uh, at most, uh, when we come to you with a full plan. Um, but um, uh, the driveway configuration is confusing there, and people often end up uh, parking in the health center. Uh, parking lot. Um, so, do you remember what the I would like to ask a tag on question about that in terms of you ever. I'm not sure we we haven't tackled this. There's no unified parking plan for Woodstock, but 
in your other projects, have you ever done a parking sharing arrangement in order to kind of utilize, underutilize spaces, let's sure. say, you know, night parking for residents, yeah. daytime for businesses, so we can really cut down on asphalt and all of those, you know, dead parking spaces that don't really add vitality to anything? Yeah, so um, the, the unfortunately, um, we, we had the best place in terms of an example um, has been in um, Lebanon. Um, so the Lebanon uh, Central Business District does not have a minimum parking requirement. So we did, um, there were adjacent, we have a building in West Lebanon uh, called Tracy Street um, that is next to the Kilton Library, public transportation there, the whole thing, very walkable uh, as well. Um, that site, we ended up having one space per unit um, that is workforce housing, uh, but we also um, have a sharing of, uh, of handicap spaces. Um, so we've got four handicap spaces that serve not only the Twin Pines property, but the Mascoma Bank branch next door. So that, um, that facility, Mascoma Bank, has their, uh, their board meetings there. They have a boardroom there. Um, but we were able to share some parking there. And in fact, we're looking at doing some, some um, EV charging uh, in conjunction with, um, with them uh, there uh, because of, of the ability to kind of share those facilities between daytime users at the bank and uh, evening and nighttime users um, residing uh, in the Twin Pines property. So that's probably the best example um, of, of kind of a sharing. Um, we'd like to see more of that, uh, candidly. Um, so many of our properties are, are uh, however, are really just um, uniquely residential. So there's less of an opportunity to do that. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. We really appreciate you both joining yeah, us. Thank you. You're welcome to hang around, but. Um... Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your time and uh, and and your 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 questions and and thoughts on this, these matters. Look forward Thank to you. continuing the conversation. Thank you. We're excited about. I'm excited about this project. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, it looks like we have two agenda items left. No, oh, three. Excuse me. Um, review, discuss, and draft amendments to the Planning Commission's rules of procedure and election of officers and terms, and then discuss village sign regulations and next steps. Um, <clears throat> great, I mean, personally, my, my goal would be to, you know, wrap up by around nine o'clock. Um, that would be ideal for, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll go as long as we need to go. Um, so let's um, well, let's just go in order. Let's start with the um, rules of procedure. Um, <clears throat> and this has come up. Um, there have been various discussions, um, you know, touching on this. Um, you know, I think for you know almost the last year um, to really talk about you know exactly what. Our role is um, and what the uh, zoning administrator, the um, planning director's role is, um, you know, and how we how we all work together. Um, I will say, I'll you know clearly this needs to be updated, um, and so we probably don't need to. I would recommend that we don't need to, we can have a discussion about it tonight, but we don't need to actually edit it um, tonight. Maybe we can do that um, via Google Doc, uh, you know, between now and the next meeting. Um, but I would love to open it up to discussion, to thoughts. Um, and Stephen, did you have anything? Did you need to tee this up in any way? Um, no, I'll just uh, second your, your idea. Um, not only because we're we're running significantly behind, and I too would like to wrap up before nine, um, but simply I think the idea is essentially to have uh, to kind of do a whiteboard um, to just kind of talk about these things and not think of them in draft language tonight, and then you know work on specific language 
uh, in between the next the next meeting and hopefully have kind of a draft to work on at the next meeting. Great. Um, I have some thoughts, Mary Margaret. If and they're they're quite scattered, so um, I guess I'll just start throwing them out for the purposes of starting a conversation, um, and then I'm going to take a much needed bathroom break if that's okay. Um, uh, two things that I've I've been thinking about, and I I think I've brought up to several folks, um, probably individually on the commission, and also to Stephen, is that um, I know that other towns meet more frequently than once a month. Um, I'd be curious on opening that up and maybe having a discussion within the rules of procedure, if if folks are open to that. And and I say that caveated with. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm coming at this the wrong way. I'm coming at this backwards in terms of like our roles and responsibilities. But um, I think, you know, like last meeting went so long and, and so over and, and certainly um, I think we all have like a lot of different things that we're working on and a lot of things we want to see accomplished. Um, and so not necessarily for the... Um, the quantity of work, but I wonder for the like momentum of work, um, if folks would be open to meeting twice a month, but for a for a time capped time. So like meeting for um, like an hour and a half tops, if we were to do like every second Wednesday. And I know that's more of a commitment than we're we are doing right now. Um, but as a part of the conversation, I'd like to see if, if folks would be willing to do that as a part of the rules um, or not the rules, but amend to say we could meet more frequently. Um, I think another thing that I'll reiterate that you and Stephen both highlighted is I think that um, as the, one of the newer members of the Planning Commission, um, I'm really glad we're having this discussion because I think having the clarity will help. I think there's a lot of um, I wasn't on the planning commission when we had a different director and also a different chair. Um, and so I think just like reestablishing and getting clarity on like what we want our roles and responsibilities to be and how, how and where that accountability flows from. Um, so like I was thinking I have a really rough, well, I, I guess if I was like sketching it um, in terms of like how I've seen it, and again, this is not to say this is how it should be, but um, I've seen kind of the flow of power being like with the voters at the top, the voters and residents of Woodstock, and then under that being like the select board and the trustees, and then under that being the planning and zoning office because they give direct power to the office, and then under that being like all the various boards and commissions um, that that are under planning and zoning us, the VDRB, DRB, TDRB, Conservation Commission, Historical Commission. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so those those two things, I guess I'll just, uh, I guess, yeah, that's, those are the, the two things I wanted to highlight. There's other stuff that I'd be happy to edit that are more nitty gritty, but. Um, <clears throat> Great, thanks, Laura. Um, any any responses or additions from anybody else? <clears throat> I can frame up, um, hopefully I didn't jump on anybody's toes. Um, I can, so I might be the only person, <laughs> well, at least Susan's been on longer than me. Um, but so I was, but I was on when Sally Miller was the chair and Neil was the, um, was the zoning administrator. And um, obviously we can shape this however we, not however we want, but we can, we can, we're, we're, we're taking an opportunity to shape this. But the way that that worked is Neil was, Neil was pretty clearly the, clerk um in this uh in terms of how he worked with the commission so he provided um expertise but leadership on the direction that the plan you know the agenda that the the 
planning commission um, established. They established it for themselves. Um, the uh, you know the, the decisions that they made that clearly came from the commission um, with the advice um, and support of Neil. Um, so that's that's how that worked. Um, Susan, did you see that similarly or? Um, yeah, no, I'm here. I, I'm, um, I did. I just, I think, I think there was a lot of work in prepping for our meetings between Neil and Sally, that they were in contact regularly. I, I, I can't say that for sure, but just understanding kind of what went on to prep for the meetings and the agenda. That's just, I guess that would be my addition to that, mm -hmm. is that there was a lot of, I don't want to say behind the scenes, it wasn't decision making, but it was going over what was up, you know, what was happening in the town, kind of a regular, they were, they seemed to be in constant contact. That's all I would add. One of the reasons that I wanted to have this conversation is that I think that some of the thing, so back in February, um, we voted that uh, we, we voted in Laura as the clerk, but we, and, but we, the job description is different than what is in this rules of procedure. It also added specific responsibility for ensuring that, um, I can't remember, the, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but ensuring that all laws were complied with, including the open meeting law. And I do not think that that is appropriate for a volunteer. I think that compliance with the law should sit with staff because there's town attorneys who will support the staff if something goes wrong. Um, and that was my feeling on that particular issue. So that's why I, I, I wanted to have this conversation. Yeah, and I, I think that's fine. I mean, that doesn't, um, that that makes sense to me as a clerk. I mean, if, again, the clerk description, it fascinates me that the bylaws uh, have like enumerated a lot of duties for the clerk, um, a lot more duties for the clerk in this uh, document than maybe some of the other officers, um, like uh, conduct all official correspondence. Uh, and what does it say? Uh, file with the town clerk as public record. Um, That's why I think that this, that responsibility was held by the staff. So in the past, yeah. Neil, Neil was essentially the clerk, although I don't remember naming him as such, but yeah. I'm, and I, and maybe that's like something we can rewrite when we uh, do edits, because like, I think that like, I, I, my understanding, at least from my experience on other boards and, and from what I've seen around other town or from around town on other commissions is just that, um, you know, it's someone who keeps information. It's not necessarily someone who's, you know, has any more authority than anybody else to um, certainly like interpret or be responsible for law compliance. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's certainly not why I took on the why I took on the role of the clerk, but um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to to edit this in the Google Docs. Um, I also think you know to tag along to what you and Susan have said. I think that um, I think that the chair should be a collaborator. Um, with Stephen and also maybe this lives with the chair, maybe this lives with a subcommittee or maybe this lives with somebody else, but there's um, in Pomfret, they have uh, 
they have someone that like coordinates with the rest of the commissions in town to say like, this is what we're working on. This is what we're doing. Do you want to come? Um, which I think is great and something that I've certainly thought about would be great. And I think, you know, in, in having a lot of the conversations we've had over the past month, we know that there's a limited number of resources coming from the planning and zoning office. Super grateful that Stephanie is here now, obviously. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, I just, I think that there's, and you know, a lot of this, I guess I'll say in highlighting a lot of this, I would love to see coming from the select board and the trustees even, um, from a, from a proactivity level or an awareness level or a, just an efficiency level. Um, and right now we don't necessarily have that, um, but I think we can also, like with the website and a lot of the other stuff we're doing, we can certainly be an example for, for the town and for other committees. Um, and with that, I really do have to go to the bathroom, so I'm gonna excuse myself, but I will be back shortly. <laughs> Um, Stephen, would it be possible to get uh, an example of um, planning commission bylaws from like Two Rivers? Uh, yeah, Two Rivers and, and other towns. Um, yeah, we, I have those. Um, yeah, something that's more recent than. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, reading even through like the clerk's position, um, I don't remember exactly what year. I thought it was before 2005, but it may not have been. So going back in history, uh, the, with the moment in time when the town of Woodstock created the DRB and took away, I mean, before the creation of the, of the ZBA and then the DRB, uh, the Planning Commission did those reviews of applications. Right. Uh, and so reading reading the clerk's description almost makes me think that this goes back to a time when the Planning Commission reviewed the actual application, um, which is another reason why it's, it's, it's time to review and look at, at all of these. Um, I think in general, Mary, Mary about the where where it would be nice in the language to to have, you know, can apply, you know, in some cities, the, the, the clerk has to be a planning, uh, a planning commission member. We don't have that here. Uh, maybe we could say it can be a planning commission member or uh, staff, or we say it's only allowed to be staff. Um, the only reason why that's problematic is, is in situations uh, like we've had in the, over the last year where I've been pretty much by myself. Um, or if we had a situation where we were missing a lot of members at one time. So yeah, we don't, we don't have the clarification here in these rules, but we could sure put it in. Okay, great. Um, are there other, um, issues that people wanted to raise or do we want, do we, so that's one question. Second question is, does anyone have any response to the issue that Laura raised, which is to increase the number of meetings? You know, I'm, I'm rolling off the commission, so this doesn't really affect me. I guess my only thought would be any concern that it might be harder to recruit new commission members. And I'm not sure, it might be better. You know, I think we are better than most commissions. I, I know commissions that will go three and four hour meetings longer, you know. And um, so I just don't know where people stand on that. If you think it would be harder, I think trying to limit them to an hour and a half is a great idea. Yeah, or maybe framed another way, Susan. I guess how I've been thinking about it is not necessarily increasing the time um, or increasing the frequency as much as keeping the same time just spread across two meetings as opposed to 
um, I think we've been trending towards these like marathon meetings <laughs> um, that get that can yeah. get very exhausting. Um, they are. I just wonder if it's going to be hard for people to walk out to meetings a month. That's all. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I think it's a good point. I think. Um, but I do think our productivity goes down. I mean, no one really wants to sign up on a weeknight for a three or four hour meeting. Yeah. I know that I would have difficulty with two meetings a month, um, but I'm, I'm, and I hear what you're saying. I'm wondering if there's more work that we could do, you know, offline, like if there's more um, sanctioned, you know, <laughs> exchanges that we can have. Like for instance, we have a Google doc of this rules, rules procedure. We can do a lot of that work. Um, in between the meeting at our own, you know, at our own pace. I, I mean, I think that's also an alternative. I think it's just a matter of agreeing as a group to the, um, to the level of responsibility and accountability of doing that asynchronous work. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that that would be a, a piece of that. Um, especially because like we have members that just have a hard time showing up to our meetings period. Yeah, what I, uh, if I can weigh in on the, on the idea of the meeting commitment is still roughly three hours a month. Uh, I think what Laura is saying is just splitting it up to two uh, hour and a half, you know, 90 minute sessions um, while also doing a lot more, doing more work in between as well. But it's it's essentially trying to to get people within that that knowledge of that being on being a commissioner on the board, you know, it'll it'll take a good three to six, um, potentially more hours hours a month, and I I think it's it's just something that I, I want to get out there as as the reality of what it what it takes to be a commissioner. I think that's also a, a good reason why we're talking about what what are the du duties of the commission itself and what we expect of commissioners when they come on. Yep. Although tonight we'll do it in two hours. So um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So let's. Um, this is a great conversation. Let's continue it. Um, if um, Stephen, if you can set this up as a Google Doc. Um, and send it out. And if everyone can weigh in and, you know, remember the, um, the open meeting rules, don't respond to what somebody else has said, only respond to what's in here um, so that there's not a not conversation and we can take this up, all of these issues up at the next meeting. Does that sound, does that sound good? I'm nodding. Yeah. All right. Could I request that the examples of other bylaws go in that same folder so we have a reference point? Yes. Do you have time to pull those together, Stephen? Uh, yeah, I, I probably won't be on there uh, tonight, but um, hopefully I'll squeeze time into tomorrow. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Thanks, Susan. Um, Okay, um, next up, election of officers and terms. Um, so, uh, Mayor Margaret, sorry, I have a question about this just because I'm wondering if we're, <laughs> if we're putting the, uh, well, we're not putting the cart before the horse uh, yet, but if it makes sense to agree to the new rules and policies and procedures and the outlining of what the roles and responsibilities are and then doing an election after we've agreed to those. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, it depends on what people's comfort levels are. I mean, I am I was not elected chair, I was elected vice chair. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm, but I'm, I guess I'm, I'm the de facto chair. Um, uh, any, any thoughts from anyone about whether we do this at this meeting or at the next um, one, which, yeah. 
I'm comfortable waiting until things are more defined. I mean, Mary Margaret, there's no question that you have the authority to be chair because the definition of you know vice chair is that you will serve if the chair can't. Yeah. Right. Right. So I don't think there's any question that you have, you know, you can do that. And it does seem to make sense what Laura's saying that we, you know, we define all of these roles. Um, any thoughts from anyone else about um, uh, pushing this agenda item off to the next meeting? I will, I, I will say, I, I don't know that it makes any difference, um, but just for, uh, I'm, I'm pressing the, uh, the, at the, at a joint meeting in, on May 31st um, to have the, uh, to have the trustees and select board interview and potentially appoint a new planning commission to take over Susan's uh, position, Susan Boston's position. Um, so I've only received one application so far, but I, again, I don't think that that necessarily changes anyone's opinion about when to elect. Just that yeah. person will likely be on, be on the board in June at the next meeting. The next scheduled meeting. Stephen, can you send around the with the applications of you know who whoever's up? I mean, you don't need to do it one at a time, but just you know before the select board meets. All right, I'm just if they're going to be joining the commission. I would love to know a little bit about them. Yeah, that's you fine. know, I seem to remember when I joined that I interviewed with both the planning commission and the select board. Is that right? I did. I think I did yeah. too, right. I don't yeah. think it should just be the select board. I'm just going off the select board's rules. Um, if we mm -hmm. want to do a special meeting before the 31st. Brad and I interviewed with the trustees and the select board at a joint meeting. Yeah. I don't, did we interview with the planning commission? I don't think we did. No. But I like the idea. So I put it assuming that's in our roles and responsibilities, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with it. We just have to find time to do that before the 31st. Um, so I put a deadline of May, I think May 19th for at least for Susan Boston's uh, vacancy. And so that's when I could send them out if we want to try and get together you know, I can do a good old-fashioned doodle poll um, if we want to try and do an interview before they go to the select board and trustees okay I mean <clears throat> can keep it nice and short um, no need to have like a full meeting okay. just be for that agenda item great so I will I will try and do I'll try and set it up where at least we know the board the week of the twenty second. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll look at the schedule and kind of see what would make sense. Um, related to that, I was going to suggest um, that we develop uh, some kind of um, onboarding process. Um, I know when when. When I came on, I just kind of came on and uh, I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know anybody's bios. I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't know where to find anything. Um, this is actually the first time I'm reading the bylaws. Um, I'd be happy to take a stab at, you know, putting something together and circulating it um, if there's, uh, if people feel like there's a need for that. I love that idea. I also, I was going to mention, I'm sure you, some of you may already know this and Mary Margaret, you probably do too. Um, but I was on the Two Rivers site looking for a zoning map regardless to put in our resources folder. And I saw that they actually have, because I know it's come up a few times in terms of like if we could do training with them, but they offer, uh, I think three or four video classes. And I was planning to um, do them when I'm on my mat leave. Um, 
and, and I think they're like maybe like 45 minutes to an hour and a half long. Um, but I just wanted to kind of like flag that for folks as like, if you're, you know, so, you know, if you're more of a self-directed person and you're interested, they've put those together and they're available online too. But I think onboarding documentation, love it all. Yeah. There's also the state um, has a packet that I looked up when I came on about how to serve on the planning commission, which is useful. Would you all mind um, just, you know, circulating yeah. that? Um, both the sure. link and the, and the and the document mm -hmm. and then and, and then yeah. and then I'll pull that into the pro protocols mm -hmm. into the onboarding. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I would love that not only not even just when you're appointed, but if you if you apply to a vacancy uh, really for any board that you go through. Um, you you get given the packet. So then before your interview, you know more, you're prepared, and you can actually kind of decide, oh, do I really have time to do this? Or do I really want to do this? Um, so I think that, that, would be, that would be a good thing to have. Great, yes, absolutely. Okay, good, um, great. We've made some decisions on that. Thanks everyone. Um, I think the only thing left on our agenda is to discuss the village sign regulations and next steps. You know, we had at the, I think the what, February meeting, we had um, voted on a temporary variance um, and May was, maybe it was the March meeting, must have been the March meeting, because uh, yeah. I don't think Stephen was there. Um, we we're just waiting for you to come back. So what what are the next steps on on that? If we can. I mean, kind of, uh, I'll kind of leave that up to the commission. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you kind of where we're at now. Um, so at that March meeting, I mean, my apologies for not being there, but the, no need to apologize. Kind of that. Temporary variance is not really something that the planning commission has authority to do. Um, we have the authority to recommend a change to the legislation or to the to the regulations themselves to the trustees. Um, if they were actually going to have a variance, they would need to go through the through the DRB approval process for the variance, and so. I also didn't know if if you know we think it's just time to to put the sign regulations, uh, especially because of this situation. If that's something that we put in our sites next, after we wrap up the housing or as we wrap up the housing draft, um, I don't. I I will. I'll let you all weigh in on on the importance of that sign regulation. Um, I kind of have a path for. Those uh, those specific residents being able to maybe find a, a temporary solution to to receiving the, the variance from the DRB, but other than that, as we have more businesses that are similarly situated, we're going to continue to have the the problem that they have. So we're not in crisis at this point. Um, you said you have a path forward for them. I think I would vote to. Um, uh, Take it up after we finish the housing. That we might as long as long as yeah, I su I support that as long as they can keep their signs up. Meanwhile, I you know there's a there's a theme through much of the work that we've had in the last year, and that is time is of the essence and time is money, which we all know. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, historically planning commissions and most government operations have just grind things to a halt, right? <laughs> and, and it would be nice to think about how, and maybe this gets back to Laura's meet, the meeting twice a month, right? It allows you to be a little bit more nimble and, and quick about responding to things. Um, it would be nice to know that we are supporting. We're not. We're not by our very nature and dragging things on, 
you know, really scuttling things that we want to support, you know, business success, affordable housing financing, you know, oh, grants, you know, from the state, whatever it is. So Stephen, uh, can you tell us, I mean, he, you know, he can keep his sign while you work on a path forward. <laughs> Um, so the so the path forward, uh, the the temporary path forward is is applying and receiving a variance from the DRB. Problem is that very well uh, could be denied, and so then that's that's where if denied, that kind of puts more pressure on the planning commission to then draft something up uh, for trustees review. Um, so it's not it's not something that's on fire, but um, if the DRB sees sees their situation as something that could they could approve a variance, then you know then then that would give them a temporary solution for a certain period of time. But I, I don't know for sure. That's just a the potential path forward that we have right now. Until really, until the regulations around signs in the village change, uh, there's there's no true protection for what the banks are trying to do. Now, what if we? Is there any way for us to like support the variance with like a a statement to the DRB saying, "Hey, we're looking to make some changes coming up that would make this allowed." So we ask you to please consider that this is something that we're going to try to do regardless, you know, eventually. So please approve the variance. Yeah, I mean, there's even a, so there's, so that, that would be the way that we could, that the planning commission could potentially support it. Um, yeah. I, I, and the DRB enforces the rules as, as they are. So I don't, I don't know whether or not that would be perfect or not. Um, and it, it bounces on a potential ethical separation line. But I don't think it's completely crushing it. Um, and then the other avenue would be even if we drafted up something quickly and presented it to the trustees uh, as, as an interim fix that just said, hey, for six months, you know, we're gonna waive, we're gonna waive certain village ordinance. We could, that's a way that we could do it quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then have a backstop so that we could say, okay, we're going to give ourselves X amount of time to figure out what that what that should be, which is essentially what we're trying to push for with the uh, short term rental. Um, mm -hmm. Is that you know if we don't issue any any new permits for signs, or we say, um, you know, these prohibitions don't don't count right now for the next six months, and we put push for an interim bylaw change that goes just directly in front of the trustees. Um, another possibility. So this question was really just about to gauge uh, how quickly should we take this up? Yep. So it's still with the TDR, TDRB, right? Or no, I mean, no, they have not put in an application yet. Um, oh, okay. So, so, I mean, so far it, it's, they, yeah, it, they, they haven't put one in yet, but I'm, I'm going to request that they do for the, for the variance to the, to the village regulations. Um, so we could wait, see what that result is, uh, make move make movements from there or try and get on top of this in the other ways that I've that I've laid out. I'm wondering if um I wasn't here for when um for for the first part of COVID when we I don't know if we did this or if it was waived by the select board and the trustees to like allow businesses to have signs, but Yeah. And is it po is it possible to just like use some of that language to um maybe like limit I don't know. I don't know. 
to give them the opportunity to, to be in compliance, but also like limit the signage that is available to businesses. Like signs gotta look like this. I don't know. I think these, I think there's a lot of options on the table and a lot of questions. Um, and, um, but it also doesn't feel like it's a, it's a, it's a crisis, right? So yeah. they haven't even applied yet. Um, my recommendation would be to see where we are at the next meeting um, and carve out more time for this conversation. Okay. How do others feel about that? I think we should definitely carve out more time. And I also think that we should come up with a universal signage program that works for the entire community. So we don't have to ever have to have this discussion again. And that we can also empower businesses to be able to do whatever they need to do in this community. Love the enthusiasm, Frank. All right. Um, Susan, does this get at your concern about, you know, not, not being a barrier? Um, I mean, I know waiting a month is. Um, I think it does. I mean, I think there'll be a crisis if they're turned down for the variants right at the height of tourist season, which is a little concerning. So I think if we could at least put in a letter of support and say, we're going to be revisiting this, it might help without a lot of effort, but it, it, um, by our meeting next month, Stephen, they're still not going to have gone through, right? And will they have had a meeting by then for their variants? Um, I mean, potentially at the end of at the end of May, the second mm -hmm. MediaRV meeting in May. Um, okay. So possible. Well, maybe we should just let them move forward and see what happens, and then be prepared to meet much quickly. I don't know. I mean, I, I like the idea of just submitting a letter of support whenever they uh, put in their application. Okay. Can't hurt. Yeah. And then we just take it up at the next meeting as needed. Sure. Is that something that we need to vote on? No, I think that's just a plan for, for next meeting. For the next meeting. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any other business? All right. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Great. Any second? I'll second. All right. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Great night. Great job, everyone. Right at Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye, Bye all. Have a good night, folks.